Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to another evening in the bizarre world of Corona, <laughs> where everything is done virtually. This has almost become the norm. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, I'd like to thank the uh, Cronkite School for giving me the opportunity to have a discussion with um, someone I've known for a long time, admired for a, a long time, uh, personally, professionally. Um, you know, uh, I'm talking about, of course, the great Herm Edwards. Um, you know, Herm, is, Herm Edwards, I'm going to give you his formal bio, but just personally, uh, ever since I guess I, I met uh, uh, Herm professionally, I guess when he was the head coach of the New York Jets. And, you know, New York is not an easy place. It's the greatest city in the world, but it's not an easy place to coach. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's not, I still have battle scars. I still have battle scars. Oh, of course, that's the whole point. <laughs> but, but I must say, though, that um, Herm was probably the most enjoyable uh, head coach I uh, encountered, uh, particularly in this area. Uh, you know, he, he had just great energy, a great sense of humor, great attitude. Um, and we'll talk a little more about the energy. I have no idea of where you get all this energy from, but but the day in and day out face the New York media, win or, win or lose, never really, never really lost this temper, and never really, you know, uh, exploded, uh, which is rare in this market. Um, but um, so, yeah, like I said, Herm was probably one of the most enjoyable uh, head coaches I've ever uh, I've ever been around, so it's really is a it's a um, uh, an honor. I don't throw that word around a lot, but it's really a, an honor to have a discussion uh, with you, Coach Edwards, particularly in these um, unique times. I don't know if you've ever been anything like this. Uh, I have not. <laughs> so. Yeah, Bill. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and for all those that are listening, obviously. Um, uh, Bill has done uh, a fabulous job with his career. If you've watched him, uh, all the platforms he has spoken from, but, but our first encounter was actually in New York. And, and you're right, for the most part, I, I kept my poise, except for that one press conference when I said this. <laughs> I still get residuals. <laughs> so my well, wife is very happy. <laughs> that's right. Well, well, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm doing good. <laughs> you played well, yeah, and, and you know, but that's that's the sign of a real pro. Like everything is in play. There's nothing bad. It's all good. It's all good. It's Tell all me good. how I forgot. How did that come about? You played the win. How did that come about? Well, we were actually, um, you know, we, we go to the playoffs our first year, uh, first time in the history any coach in the New York Jets has taken a, a team to the playoffs. And the next year, we stumble out of the blocks, if you remember, and we were at two and five. And I made the switch with Chad Pennington uh, becoming the starting quarterback. And the question was asked, and you know the press conferences, how they work, Bill. You know, especially on a Tuesday, there's no players in the building. And um, you have all the media now, and they are, they are on full. They are on full. I'm real good after them today, right? Because <laughs> we're two and five. And remember Judy Batista, right? Remember Judy Batista? Oh, of course. Of course. Dear she friend. in the audience, and she, asked, she starts going to this question about, basically, she's going to ask me, did the team quit, right? And before she could get it out, I just kind of went off, you know? And, 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 and this is on a Tuesday, and there's no players in the building, and it's Tuesday around 10 o'clock, and after the press conference, you go back, and you're still meeting with the coaches, and, and I let it go from there. I just kind of let it go, said what I needed to say. And it's kind of ironic. I get home that night around around 12:30, generally on Tuesdays, you know. And you've been in the office all day, and I'm tired. And the light switch comes on. My wife walks out. And she looks at me, and she says, "What did you do?" And I, went, <laughs> I don't even remember what I said at that point, right? She said, "It's been all over the news." It's been, like, what are you talking about? And she says, "What you said?" And she kind of repeats it. And I go, "I said, I said, really, it's all over the place, huh?" She said, "Yeah." So I go back. The next day, on Wednesday, and I'm getting ready to address the team. And Chad Pennington is sitting there, and he's in a meeting with the whole team. And he stands up. He says, Coach, we got it. We win the division. We end up winning the division. So it's just one of those moments, you know, where you're compelled to say something to, to, 
to try to protect uh, the integrity of the game, but also protect the locker room and let them know, okay. you know we're, we're, we're playing to win now. It doesn't right. matter how many games we have not won. We right. still got a schedule to finish, and we're going to get it done. And so it's kind of unique how that stuff works sometimes. Yeah. And now the question is, does Judy get any get any residuals? She says it all the time. She says, you know, you know, you know, you're the reason you get. I'm the reason you get to write that book. I said, well, <laughs> uh, uh, just just I just want to give you a formal uh, uh, bio, and it's it's, it's so e extensive. Um, you know, that's the great thing about when you've been in this business as long as you have, you've got a big bio uh, that we can condense it. But uh, you became the head coach of uh, Arizona State, December 2017. And um, really done a great job uh, at uh, ASU. Really done a spectacular job, particularly last year, which I guess um, is why, uh, and we'll get into this, but why not being able to play this season, well, at least this fall, is such a bummer because you had so much momentum. You were really building uh, to something. Great young quarterback, uh, Jaden uh, Daniels, uh, you know. Um, but you were five years as a head coach uh, of, the, of the Jets. Uh, three seasons with the Kansas City Chiefs, right? I think yep. you uh, set the table for the Super Bowl yep. uh, to come, you yep. know. Uh, and uh, then after the Chiefs, I think a lot of people got to know you, a lot of younger people got to know you uh, with the, um, uh, the network, the NFL Live program. You were an analyst yep. Uh, yep. for the uh, NFL Live program. And it's so funny how things work, Herm. You can talk about this. There are guys who are analysts now, but who have great playing careers. But there's a generation of people who didn't even know that they they played. They just knew them as studio analysts or play-by-play -play commentators. They, they had no idea that you know you had like this incredible double-digit playing career. They know you as the guy who brought the energy from the you know the NFL Live program. Um, and, and they're just although we met professionally uh, when you were coach with the Jets, I first came in contact with you, I mean, not even up, in 1978. 1978, yeah. uh, you, you, you were the Giants. No, I mean, you were the, the Eagles. The you were the Giants, Eagles. The Giant play. Yeah, the, the, fam the famous play. And I want you to take us through that just for any Giants fan. But just to set the scene, you know, it was, it was I think it was like the, um, uh, what is it, 12th game of the season, yep. right? Uh, Giants at Giants in the Meadowlands, right. uh, and, you, and the Giants were ahead, 17 to 12. Eagles had no timeouts <laughs> remaining, you know, but instead of, like, taking the snap from center and then just sort of kneeling, Joe Pissarik, your friend and I, mine, uh, he attempted to hand the ball off to Larry Zaka. But explain what happened after that. Well, that, that, that is what you call the – it was called a miracle in the Meadowlands. Um, I actually picked up the ball, ran the fumble in for a touchdown. We win the football game. And from that day forward, the take the knee became a part of the National Football League. It's kind of ironic. You know, when you, you know, you think about a little bit of my career, I was very fortunate. I coached and played in the league for 30 years. And that play happened in 1978. And um, people still talk about it. It just, it just it, it continues to live. Now, obviously, when you work for ESPN, they show it because you're part of their network and you're part of their crew, so they show it. But it was one of those things, being in the right place at the right time, and then the knee uh, came into vogue after that, where people take a knee, the quarterback sits down, and the guys get behind him, so there's not a fumble. But that's why that occurred. Yeah, what did that do for um, your, your career? I mean, you, you, like you said, you had an incredible playing career, but a lot of people know you for the – what did that do for your for your I don't know your your playing career? Did that add years on it? Add notoriety to well, it? I, yeah, it, it, some notoriety because here again, Bill, it happens in New York. So anything you know when it happens in New right. York, it, it's it's you know, because remember back then there was uh, ESPN wasn't even a, ESPN right. wasn't a station yet. So right. you basically had three stations, and so this thing is shown all over the country on, on you know from different news stations. And the fact that it was a play that was one of those ones, how did this just happen, right? And for us, it, it propelled our football team to get in the playoffs. So we got in the playoffs the next year, and then from there again, and then finally went to the Super Bowl. So it was one of those plays that, that kind of propelled our football team. We won a game when a lot of people thought we, we shouldn't have won it, uh, ended up winning it, and got a lot of confidence as a football team, then marched on and got into the Super Bowl two years later. What's, what's it like, again, you went to the Super Bowl. When you see Super Bowls now, 
I mean, could you just uh, – because there are a lot of – again, there are a lot of young people who think that the way the Super Bowls are now, they're always like this. What was the – when you went to the Super Bowl, what, what, what was like then versus what is – I'm going. I'm going to date myself now because it was in. Uh, it was Super Bowl 15. That's right. That's right. Young people on the side said 15. I That's wasn't right. even born. They're right. They're not born. Right. Uh, there was a Super Bowl. It was in New Orleans. It was actually um, the one where they tied the ribbon around the dome and the fact that the hostages were brought back, and so it was delayed because the hostages were bringing it back, and so it was delayed about 30 minutes. Uh, we played the Raiders. We didn't win. We actually lost that game. But I can remember the media, we thought a lot of media was covering that. There were about 350 media people. Well, you've been to Super Bowls of late. How many media people go to Super Bowl now? Oh, I mean, it's like thousands. I mean, it's, 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 it's a thing unto itself. It's just, it's just unbelievable, the, uh, the coverage that the Super Bowl gets. But it's amazing when uh, you're growing up and you watch Super Bowls prior and you go, Super Bowl one. when I was in Super Bowl 15, when I thought about Super Bowl one, I, I said, boy, that was a long time ago. Now I'm telling these young people that are, that are on this Zoom that I played in Super Bowl 15. <laughs> like <laughs> Super Bowl 50 was just played, correct? Am I, am I correct on that? Super Bowl 50 was just played? Yeah, I yeah. Super Bowl 15. 15. Oh, Think okay. about that. It's, it's hard yeah. to compute, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, I, and I remember, I remember uh, like Super Bowl one, two, three, you know. Uh, <laughs> I had a, uh, I was a huge Kansas City Chiefs fan uh, because one of my, uh, I had a substitute teacher. She, I went from Chicago and in high school, one of my substitute teachers was a guy named Gloucester Richardson. Yeah, Gloucester Richardson, yes. Who, who just passed away, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, Gloucester Richardson, I went to Morgan State, so it was Willie Lanier yeah, all and right. all those guys. I was a big yeah. AFL guy, yeah. you know, and, and was just like, like just crush, you know, just crush. But, but you're right. I mean, let's not go down memory lane. But the fact that we're talking about one all the way now to like 50 is right. just unbelievable. It really is. Right. Well, think about it now. We're, we're, we're doing something uh, for these young people, and it's all through electronics, right? We're all on a camera now. I mean, there was, there was only three networks. <laughs> there was no cell phones. Right. You didn't have the ability to do this. But this is right. a way for us to connect, obviously. Uh, to, to anyone in the world now, you can connect to somebody. It's right. amazing where electronics and technology has, has brought us. Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to um, I, I talk a, a, a lot about this situation here, you know, with, with no football this fall and all that. But before that, I just want one more note about your career. And, and this is setting up a question. You know, you now coach a lot of young people who want to get to the league and all that. And, you know, I don't know about you, I guess the older I get, I'm a real big test of time person. I'm, I'm following this thing about Luka Doncic uh, in, in, with the playoffs. And everybody's making this huge deal. I said, well, okay, this is like two years, okay? I think of people like Michael Jordan, uh, who averaged whatever on the course of like how many years? Jim Brown, who averaged like, I don't know, five yards of care for like 10 years. You know what I mean? With, with, with everybody – figuring out how do we stop this guy in over 10 years. And you've played against guys like that. But you played with the Eagles. Then you played with Atlanta. You played with the Rams. So your career basically spanned from, like, at 77 all the way to, like, 86, yes. right? Yes. And I guess what you try to get to your players is that, okay, everybody wants to get to – it's one thing to get to Arizona State. It's not that they even get to the NFL, but it's another thing – to stay there, to have 10-year careers. What do you tell them? Because it's not always about the talent. It's, I mean, there's, there's so many other things. I, I think for anyone, uh, I talk about this all the time, is, is first of all, somewhere in your lifetime, you got to decide what is your purpose? What, what is your purpose? And what, what are you willing to give up to achieve that? All right? You know, we live in this world now, everything's a fingertip away, right? And, and everything happens really fast. We live in this world of multitasking, which is great. But, but it, has this, it, it has some flaws in it as well. And, and the patient level of people and what you're willing to give up, it's not, it, 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 you know, it's one of those levels where if I don't get it quickly, right. I move on. Well, 
you know, life is about your purpose, but what are you willing to give up? And for me as being an athlete, and I tell my athletes all the time, it's not so much of your talent. It's more of this. Are you available? Are you available? I mean, like, you need to be available. Whatever you do in life, you have to be available and have the thought, press of, the thought process of this. How can I better myself today? I just try to win the day. I, you know, we have long-term plans and all these things. Okay, what can I do to improve me today? H how can I grow? And that was kind of my, my calling card. Um, my claim to fame, I, I tell people all the time in, in athletics as a, as a football player, uh, from high school to college to professional football, um, I never missed a practice. Right. I used to start. Right. I was available. What that's incredible. Right. There's, there's this thing called availability. Right. That's an incredible stat, uh, I mean, that, that's my most never thing I've that. ever accomplished. <laughs> to be quite honest. I tell people, I tell players that, and they look at me to go, what? And I said, I never missed a start. Right. And I never missed a practice. Right. Because this was my life. This is what I wanted to do. Right. This was my purpose. I said, I'm going to be. I, I, I'm going to use everything in my being to try to achieve what I want to do. And that was to be a professional football player. That was my way out. That was my way of paying for my education to go to right. college because I had enough talent. Okay. I figured out my purpose. I had enough talent. I said, no, what am I going to do? This is what I want to do. And that's how I did it. I had a lot of people to help me along the way, but that was that, that, that right there made me focus. And I didn't listen to the noises outside of, 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 my, of my vision. You know, we listen to too many outside noises. We get influenced by a lot of people because there's a lot of information out there. But what is your purpose? I tell people that all the time. What is your purpose? What, do you, what fulfills you? What gives you that? Once you find that, then you got direction of where you want to go. Yeah. It's funny. You, you, not, not funny. You mentioned I'm a little sad today. Um, a really good professional friend of mine, John Thompson, passed away. Yes. And, and um, again, you know, you know, as you get older, that's just one of the, the trade-offs. The older you get, the more people close to you are, are going to probably leave out of here. But mm -hmm. you mentioned purpose. And I, I just think of a guy like Coach Thompson. I'm sure your life is filled with him. But, you know, I, one of the things he taught me, and uh, even I was a reporter covering him, but it's about a certain point. This, our business, the business you're in, I'm in, it gets to be, it's not really about numbers anymore. It's not about the wins, losses. I mean, clearly you gotta win, but it's about how many lives do you touch? How many, how many lives do you change? Uh, and at this point of your life, um, you know, there, you, you've, you've had a lot of young men and women if you're in and out in your life that you've touched. And I'm wondering if, you know, let's talk about purpose, at what point, did maybe your purpose change from, you know, you're climbing that ladder, you're climbing the ladder, you're trying to do this, and then you want to, it, it changes, you know? Yeah, it does. And, and you make a great point. And, and I think when I became a coach, uh, especially at the professional level, and that's different than coaching college, because that is a profession. They, they, that's their livelihood. When you get to college, you, you realize this, they're student athletes. They all have these ideas of, of becoming a professional football player. That's great. 2% of a double pressure football player of all the guys in the country. And the life expectancy is 3.5 years. I know this. I was in that league. I lived in that league for 30 years. That number never changes. And so for me, if I can give them information, I, I'm an information provider. You know, everything you've learned, I've learned, we've actually learned from somebody else. Everyone on this monitor, uh, when, they, when they attend a class, <laughs> now on, on a monitor, but right. they right. information from someone else. They learn things from other people. How do they apply the things they learn to their life? What makes sense to them, right? For me, if a guy graduates from here and I make him the best version of who he is, I've won. Yeah. I've won. That's, I mean, when a parent comes in here and sits across from me, and they're 
young man decides to come to ASU to be a student athlete. I tell him that. I tell him, I'm going to make him the best version of who he is. That's my job. You turn your son over to me. That is my job. The football will take care of itself. Right. If, I make, if I make sure he's the best version of himself and everything else he does, he'll be a good football player. Mm -hmm. It all just kind of works hand in hand. Yeah. 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 Let, let, let's, let's stay there. Um, you know, you've been coaching football almost straight. How's it, you know, how, how are you coping with this? This is going to be the first time in a while that no. there's not going to be fall football. Uh, you know, the Pac-10, the I mean, Pac-12 made a decision, uh, which I thought was a smart decision, uh, followed by the Big uh, Big Ten made a decision. No fall sports. Um, did that – how did you feel about that decision and how are you coping? Well, I wasn't really surprised because I knew the medical professionals were going to lead us. Uh, and that was from the beginning. We all knew that. And um, I, I think as the thing continued to go down the road of maybe trying to come back, um, they realized that it wasn't safe at this point. And, and, and for some teams in California, especially, uh, it, you know, it, it, it wasn't safe enough. And then when the heart situation came up, that became another red flag. And they said, look, we need to shut this thing down and just wait, right? Now, the players were always in the loop of this. And you're right, because generally when you're, when you're an athlete or a coach, there's this journey you take, just like, just like the students, you know, they were prepared to come to campus to come to go to class. <laughs> All of a sudden, you've been doing that your whole life as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a student, right? A high school student, college student, you, you kind of, okay, the year starts. I can't wait. First day of school, where we're going to, well, all of a sudden, oh, we'll slow down. We got to slow this down. And so you had to adjust. And for our players, they're still working out. They're still in the building, but there's no end game. So how do you keep them motivated? Because their life is about this competition. They want to compete. They're competitive people. They're a personality. They want to compete. And the competition is you, you, you practice all these hours for days and for months to have a season. Well, it's been postponed. Right. It, it was almost one of those deals where they went, oh, you know, but now you got to keep them engaged because, you know, th th sports is kind of funny. You, you have a pocket of a season, but really the preparation is longer than the season. Right, right. So now it's back to preparing. And, I, and, and, that, and that's what I'm selling right now. We have to prepare. We have to prepare to play because there's going to come a time when we play, probably in 2021. We, we get that. When that appears, we don't know. We're hoping in the spring. Uh, there, there's talk about a shortening of the season, which might take place according to what the virus does and the, and the medical people need to do. So I, I tell them, you have to prepare for this because when they say it's time to go, we can't have the excuse of, well, I didn't think there was going to be a season. There's going to be a season. We just don't know when it's going to start. But let me ask you this. We talked about this before, and, and this, I'm baffled. This is a journalist. Now, you've got some really intelligent people <laughs> of the, in the Pac-12 <laughs> and the Big Ten, really smart people, smart doctors. I mean, the best world saying, you know what? We got to shut it down. Now we mosey on down south in the SEC and the ACC, and the the uh, the big uh, big twelve, they got some smart doctors. Well, you know what? Our doctors say, you know, looking at the same picture, we ain't gonna shut it down. We're gonna play football. Now, I'm asking you as a parent and as a coach, yeah. you know, and and, 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 and I don't want you to have walk because you may want to coach in Alabama a couple of years now. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to. This is my last job. I'm not going anywhere. I'm safe. <laughs> All right, but tell tell me what's your analysis of that? As, what, how do we come, how do all these intelligent people, is it about, tell, what, what, what why? Well, I, that, that's, that's a good question, why, right? And, and, and I know this, and I'm not going to try to get out of the question, but, but I'll tell you politically the correct way to do it. Um, I work in the Pac-12 conference, and our doctors told us, along with our, our presidents and our, our, our chancellors, when they took the vote, it was 12-0, and we weren't playing. So I'm just the head ball coach, and I'm going, okay, you tell us we're not playing, I'm going to get ready to play. Why those other guys are playing, I, I don't know. I know this. I wish them luck. And I hope no one gets sick. Um, I, 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 I think this, I think they're all, they all understand there could be some stoppage in play, you know, the coordinator. 
if the virus hits your football team. And that's the problem. You know, it's more than just, um, you know, playing a game of football. It's what is it going to look like? Right. What if, what if uh, you hit a case on your team and your whole offensive line is gone? Who's going to play? You know, I mean. Next man up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's not always good. What if what if the offensive coordinator goes down? Who's going to call next, plays? Next man up. I mean. You know, and so what is this going to look like? And there's there's just, you're fighting an opponent that you can't see. And you don't know when it's going to hit. All right. So, so I guess my question, her, is that, is this, and, and again, this is a political we're involved in political discussion. Is this a good look for the industry? Because you got the Ivy League saying, we're done. You got Division Two, we're done. Division Three, we're done. But you've got these these conferences yeah. who are making what seems to be financial decisions. Is this a good look for the conference when we're all arguing amateurism versus kids? Is this a good look for, for the industry? Well, I think it's not a good look for the NCAA. Well, well, right, right. Because right. They, they, they had an opportunity to make a decision to shut everybody down. And they said, look, we're going to go by your own conference and your presidents. You guys decide. They, they, they didn't want to deal with the hot potato. So they stepped out. And they kind of left it. And, and some people will say it's political, depending where in the, you know, where in the country you play. And, and some parents have gotten involved as well. And it's, so it's a mess. Yeah. Because there's no order. Right, we like order. In life, we like order. We, we like what well, it should be like. If everybody's not playing, and, and some people are playing, and some people are trying to play in the spring, and some, it, it's just, it's a mess. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like in the end. Well, I, let, let's stay here because I don't want to lose the focus on this because this is an important inter, uh, issue. And and again, I talk about our industry. Yes. You know, our it's our industry, and is there integrity? So when you're playing around with kids' lives, and and you know, like you know, you know your program. Yeah. I'm sure that if you announce tomorrow, you know, who wants to play? Everybody's going to oh, yeah. every, everybody's gonna play. Yes. Right? Like when you, you have you have you have uh, you have daughters, you have children. Yes. And I'm sure if you wanted every day who wants to eat uh ice cream for I mean, at some point you gotta step in. Yeah. I mean the one thing about athletics, you know this, is that the coaches and players want to play. And I I've always said this, I was a former player. You have to protect players from yourself. Right. Because they're all going to be, they're all in. Look, I mean, I was in the era where concussions, right. there was no concussions. Right, right. Are you kidding me? Right. They asked you to count to three. And if you got the two, they said, you're good. Go right. back and play. Right. Well, now that's changed. That, that has changed. And it should change because they're protecting the players more. So I just think we're in this place right now where we just can't, we can't find common ground. And it's a shame. Because no matter what way you look at it, there's going to be a divide and there's going to be a conversation. And that's kind of ruling the, the airwaves right now, uh, however you want to look at it. So what happens if those three conferences play, yes. right? The Big 12, but they play and they said, you know what? It's almost like a civil war in a way. They said, you know, we're going to play and we're going to crown a champion. Right. Now, here you guys are out here, the Big 10, Big 12, but, but they can play that we're going to have our – we're going to have our playoffs. We're going to crown a national champion. How do you feel about that? I mean, you know. Well, you know, it's like anything. It's like the year of uh, the strike. When we went on strike in the NFL, it was 82, 83, missed seven games. There was actually a Super Bowl winner, but it was a shortened season. We only played, like, I think eight games, nine games, right? And I want to say that's the year uh, Washington won the, won the Super Bowl. Yes, exactly. But exactly. Shortened season. So no different than this year. Uh, in the NBA or in baseball. This will go down historically as a season of the COVID season, and it was shortened. That'll go in the record books. That's what it'll look like. Not a complete season by some conferences. Some conferences decided to, to postpone. But I think at the end, historically, when these young people that are on these, on these monitors go back and look at 2020, and they're married and they have kids, they'll go, you know, I was at Arizona State, and we postponed, and whatever happens, happens, whatever that may be. And, and they'll go, yeah, and these other teams play. That's a conversation. Right? And it's going to be a part of sports history. <laughs> That's kind of interesting when you look at it that way. I like the fumble recovery. Yeah. No, same thing. That's right. <laughs> but, 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 just one more thing on that, because I do want to talk about um, 
what we've been seeing in sports and the NBA and some other things and protests. But you, you had some Ohio, you've had a number of Ohio, you know, I think Ohio State players and mother sign a petition. Yes. They're pissed. They want to play. Um, again, I, I know I'm kind of honing in on this, but again, what do you say to those young people who are saying we're being deprived, we want to play, where, where the adults in the room and the, and the Big Ten and the, and the Pac-12, I think, made, <laughs> made the most responsible decision? What do you tell them? When they well, say, oh, we've lost a year out of our, you know. Well, hopefully you'll trust the people that you, that, that you allowed uh, your sons, daughters, uh, when you put them in, the, when you turn them over to, to that school, and if they're athletes, student athletes, you trust them, you, you entrusted the coaches that are supposed to guide them. You know, you become part of that family. So you're making a decision. Right. And, and, and hopefully, whether you agree or not, they're in our care now. And that's important because they are in your care. And right. that is very important. And, and you just feel at this point in time, our conference, as well as the Big Ten, is, is not ready to play. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just uh, so we've gone over your. your you've had an extension, uh, extensive career as a, as an assistant coach, and you climb every rung of the ladder. Um, here we are in in twenty twenty twenty, and we're still talking about lack of head coaching opportunities for African Americans. Um, you've seen it from the time you started playing football. I think with Cal, then San Diego State. The number of young African Americans playing football has, you know, there's no doubt anymore that, that that black kids can play football. You know, there's no, there's no. But what is the source of this resistance? You know, um, but let me phrase the question. In other words, you've had an ample talent pool of, of of black players probably for the last thirty years, but yet when you look at the ceiling and the head coaches, there's been this persistent resistance to let that talent pool manifest in head coaches. It's almost, it's almost an embarrassment. And I'm just wondering, I know you've, been, you've talked about this, what is the source of that resistance? Why is that? It's almost like, you know, Bull Connor and the people on the Pettus Norman's Bridge saying, listen, y'all can play, y'all can play, but you can't get past here. You know, I know that's kind of dramatic, but, no, but, no. but, 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 but you're bringing some good points up because I, I, I will tell you this, um, and I'm going to age myself. But in 1977, I, I, I arrived in the National Football League. There were only 28 teams in. Most of these young people don't even know that. There were only 28 teams, 132. It was 28. And at that point in time, there were only eight, eight, I'm saying it again, eight, number eight, minority coaches in the whole league. Wow. In 1977. Wow. Eight. None of them were head coaches. Mm, wow. The playing field, the players on the field, 30% were probably men of color. In today's world, in the National Football League, 73% are men of color. There were certain positions when I came in the league in 1977. <laughs> you were not really, you were kind of subject to say, well, you're too good of an athlete. You don't need to play that position. Right. You have to be quarterback. Right. Right? The next one was if you're on a, if you're on a center, an offensive center, nah, right. you might want to play guard. Right. Uh, if you're a middle linebacker or a safety, yeah, you know, no, you don't want to play there. You want to play outside linebacker. You might want to play corner. Right. right. So there were certain positions that, you know, now you don't want to play. And they were all in this sense. They were all leadership positions. Right. They, they didn't say you couldn't play, but they said you maybe have a better chance of making a team if you play these positions. Well, that has changed. Now, the problem with the NFL, and probably college football as well, our conference not so much. Our conference has done a right. nice job of diversity as far right. as coaches, ADs, whatever you may say. But when you think about how do you, how do you become diverse, how does that work, right? Well, it's the people that, that make the decisions. And if the people that make the decisions look like each other, they come from the same backgrounds, how can you ever be diverse? How can you ever gain knowledge? Well, you can't. It's impossible. So you do the same thing over and over again. 
And until you're willing to have that conversation or let people in the room that can give you a different perspective of other people, you never gain knowledge. You stay stuck. That's the problem with America. When we huddle up, we huddle up in these little clusters of people that we know and that people are outside the group that want the same thing. We won't allow them in there. Yeah. If they're a decision maker, that's how you make your decisions. You have no idea how other people feel. You go, well, I don't know how they feel. No. Until you invite them in there in, in the room, you're never going to know. And there lies the problem. A lack of communication. So, 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 okay. So does this change? I've said, you know, okay, how do you affect change? You know, and, and I'm going to segue into the NBA for a minute. When you had, when you had players exercising their muscle, but if if enough player and their parents you say, listen, you know, we're not we're not either players making a big deal. You know what? I'm not going somewhere where there's not black coaches, where there's been no history of black coaches, or parents saying, why am I sending my child to this school? Is in a history of no black men ever in a position of authority. Why am I going to send my kid to this school? That could, do you think that when players and parents, uh, the, you know, the raw material of our in, of your industry, when the raw material, the labor, begins to speak, you know, maybe there'll be change. And do you think that's naive to expect, you know, 18, 19 year old and their parents to like make those kind of decisions? Well, I think a lot of parents are making those decisions already. Uh, just in my tenure here of, of recruiting in the last three years, going on, uh, th 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 that is one of the conversations by parents. Um, whether that's right or wrong. Here again, and think about this though. This was kind of ironic because growing up as a high school athlete, a college athlete, and a professional athlete, I never had a black position coach. Yeah. He didn't look like me. Well, I flip it the other way and go, some of these kids growing up that aren't black, they never had a, a, a white player, never had a black head coach. Right, right. right. <laughs> so it's kind of like, okay. <laughs> so, and now you're in that, you're in that, you're in that atmosphere. It's like, uh oh, okay, now how do we, but, but I think more than anything else, hopefully they don't look at that I'm a black head coach, they look at the man. Right. That's the most important thing for me, is that look at the look at the body of work of the man, right? Of the coach, and I think most parents look at that. They look at who is your head coach, what type of person is he? Um, I I, I claim to be a man of integrity. Uh, that's my calling card. My words and my actions they match up. Not sometimes, like every day. That's just who I am. Um, I'm going to stand up for what I believe, and I'm going to try to do things right, okay? And I think if, if, if parents know that about me, they entrust me with their son. They go, when he leaves here, we understand what you're going to teach him. You're not going to just to teach him football, but you're going to teach him the right things to do. And that's important to me. That's, very, that, that's my foundation. That, that's kind of who I am. So that helps you in that sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that. I, I, I'm going to ask you two questions one that has to do with the uh, NBA boycott, but another one has to go, go back to 9-11 mm. when you kind of yeah. did the same thing. Uh, that, that's very important. What do you uh, – we, we, I just asked you about player power. Your thoughts when you um, you were looking at the, the, the bubble, you know, ba ba basketball in the bubble, and uh, the Milwaukee Bucks decided they were not going to play, uh, and it spread sort of like wildfire through the – your, your, your thoughts about that? Well, I think in today's world, athletes have a beautiful platform at all levels, and they're willing to use it now without any repercussions because now it's gotten to be about money, right? You know, I've always said this. Money's a good servant, but money's a bad master. <laughs> money's a good servant, but it's a bad master. And I think money is always at the – you can always – like what's the old saying? You can always trail it back to the money. Yeah, that's right. That's follow the money. Once you start affecting people that make a lot of money, you start affecting their pocket. Boy, look, this is it. All the big corporations now, as soon as stuff happens, they're the first to have a commercial about how much money they're giving. Right. That's great. 
M money's great. Money helps people. It, 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 but there's got to be change. You can't buy your way out of this. There has to be change. This is a movement. All right? This is a movement. Money won't buy them out of it this time. Money has bought things, people out of it for years, for, 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 for years. Give them some money and they'll be quiet. They'll go away. That's not the America we see right now. That it's just not. I mean, when you watch the, the protests, when I watch the protests, I look at it from a, from a view of, of, of what I saw in the 60s. And I see people and young people of all different walks of life and different colors protesting. That's the America. That's the true America, right? And they've got power. And they know they've got power because they can make change. And, and so it's, it's uplifting to me to watch. And I tell young people all the time, I tell some of our players, I say, you know, this change that you're trying to make, it's not, it's not a light switch. You don't just turn it on. This is a boulder you're pushing. You might not see the change, but your children will see the change. That's how this thing all works. Mm -hmm. well, what's, what's your attitude? Uh, 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 what's your attitude about your own players? You mm -hmm. know, uh, when we went through the thing of the kneeling, and I think I may have asked you about this uh, a while ago. You know, uh, what was your attitude about your own players who decided that maybe they wanted to kneel during the anthem, and particularly your your background coming from a military family? Huh? Well, you know, it's kind of ironic you say that because at that point when the kneeling took place, I was working for I was working for ESPN, and I can remember when Colin decided to kneel. Now I go back to to, to Carlos and those guys, you know, right. the Olympics, right? So, I, <laughs> you know, but it was kind of funny because I can remember sitting in the studio, going. I understand what he's doing, but his message is about to get hijacked. Right. Right. Because they're going to make it not about the protest, about, you know, about racial injustice. They're going to make it about the flag. And that's what they did. Right. And he had no shot. He had no shot to survive it. Right. And, and if, if I was coaching him at that point, I would have told him, I said, you, you want to make a point? Don't go out for the national anthem. Right. Don't go out. By about the second game, they'll say, why is the quarterback not out here? Now you got a platform. Right. And you can't make it about the flag. Right. 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 So, so, yeah. so, so what was the difference between that? You, you, you mentioned Carlos, you know, Ali, uh, Mena, but, but and, and the Bucks. It seems like there was a big difference there between – those individual guys, now you've got, you know, the Bucks right before tip-off. Yeah. We ain't playing. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think for the Bucks, um, a kudos to those guys because they basically said, look, we're, 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 we're not doing this. And everyone kind of followed in suit for the most part, right? And, and I just think now young people know they have a voice and they have a platform, and they're not afraid to use it. Whether they're athletes, whether they're college students, uh, it doesn't matter. They're going to use their platform. They want to be heard. And the people that are hearing them are the big corporations. Right. Because they know that is going to affect their bottom line if they don't do things, if they don't change. That's the bottom line to all this. I'll go back to what I said. Trace it to the money. Right. It's right. always about the money at the end, right? If it affects yeah. your bottom line, you're going, ooh, this is not good. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. I know we, we got to take some questions, but I want to stay here because one of the things I, I've been wondering um, uh, that, okay, it seems like the players have gone as far as they can go. Now, at this point, you talk about money. It seems like now you need the multi-billionaire mm -hmm. who run the NFL, who run the league, whose labor pool is like these 80% black players. It seems like now you need these multi-billionaires to enter into the fight with muscle and not just throwing money at stuff, yes. but to use their power to speak right. to the to the governors and to the That's police, right. to you know, the uh, union chiefs and all that. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, they, they have to be allies. Right. That's one thing you have to have. You have to have allies. When, when you have a movement or you're trying to make change, you have to have allies that sit in the seat, that, sit, that, that they sit in those seats of change they actually can make change. They're connected to the people that can do that. So you need to win over allies. Right. Because if you have no allies, you have no shot. Right. 
And I think that that's starting to happen. You see it in corporate America even more now, where you know you look back at corporate America, they were like, "This is the way it is. We're going down this street." They have changed. You mm -hmm. see it happening all the time, and 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 that's the America. That's the dream of America, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's the dream. I mean, that, 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 that's what we sell. That's what America sells. That's why people from all over the world come to America. This is a place of opportunity. If they can get in. But that's another question. But just two last questions for you before we open up the question. <laughs> You want to come? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But listen, um, 9 11, yeah. uh, you did something really incredible. Uh, you know, I, we're both in New York, and yeah. uh, I think you did something phenomenal. Remember, we are just coming off of 9 11, and, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, the NFL wanted to play ball. Just you were the head coach of the Jets. Yeah, Take us my, through what, what happened. Yeah, it was my, it was my first year. I was a rookie head coach, and uh, opening day, we play in the Meadowlands, and we're playing against Peyton Manning, the real Peyton Manning when he was really good, not before he got old, right? <laughs> he still good at being old. People. Not pursue his all. Yeah, and we lose. And so we go home, and uh, on that Tuesday, 9-11 uh, hit. And I was sitting in my office, similar like I am today, and you could look out the window, and, and there was a – there was. You know, LaGuardia Airport was a couple miles down the way from Long Island. We were at Hofstra campus. That's where our base was then. And it was a beautiful day, and I saw no planes. For about 30 minutes, I said, no airplanes. That was strange. And it went about another hour or so, no planes. And I turned the television on, and I see this plane running into the building. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this thing. I said, what is this? And so lo and behold, it's 9-11. And so I go down and run down the hall and talk to the coaches because no players are in the, you know, no players are around. And um, they're off on Tuesdays, and everyone came back on Wednesday, and I had called the commissioner's office. I said, hey, what are we going to do? And they says, well, you know, right now we're scheduled to play. And I said, what? I said, we can't play a football game. Are you kidding me? You know, and he says, well, right now we're scheduled to play. We'll get back to you the rest of the, you know, at the end of the week and let you know if we're going to postpone and, and wait. And I go, all right. And I, I just said, okay. So I, I go into the meeting on Wednesday, and I break the news to the players. And I'm going now, guys, I said, I don't know about this plane. I said, I know how I feel. And I, and I think a lot of you guys feel the same way I do. I said, but let's just go on the field and let's try to work this out. So we go on the field about 20 minutes into practice and I can just see everyone, there's no life. So I call them back in and I say, hey, here's what you guys do. You vote. If you don't want to play and you want to forfeit the game, I got your back. I leave the room. 10 minutes, I come back, unanimous. Coach, you don't want to play. I said, good, go home. Go, uh, home. go home, with, go home, see your family, call your loved ones, do it. So now I got to walk down the hall and I tell the GM, so we got to call the owner. So I call the owner, Woody Johnson. <laughs> he says, I said, Mr. Johnson, I have something to tell you. And he says, what's that? I said, uh, if the league decides to play on Thursday, the New York Jets are not going to play. And he goes, well, what do you mean not going to play? Can we do that? And I said, yeah. And he, he said, what do we have to do? And I said, we don't get on the plane. He said, what happens? I said, we're 0-2. <laughs> I'm going, oh, boy, this ain't good. Ricky head coach, I'm 0-2. So now I got to call my wife. I got to call the boss, right? And she's at home. We're just moving into the house, right? And she's got the movers over there, and they're unpacking stuff. And I tell her, honey, tell them to slow down. <laughs> we're not going to play? <laughs> Did the league cancel? I said, no, the Jets aren't going to play. She said, oh, my Lord. <laughs> but it ended up working out, obviously. But at that moment in time, we had been attacked. Um, and I knew that football team, it wasn't time to play football. It was time to huddle up and pray and call your loved ones. And then maybe my greatest achievement that week, we actually packed up the buses, our football team, and we went down to the site. And we loaded trucks with water and stuff for the first responders that were going in and out of those buildings. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable to do that. And the whole football team went down. That was my greatest achievement as a head coach right there. Wow. Wow. Bill, I'm going to – it's it's Brett. Hi, hi coach. Hi, hi, Bill. It's Brett Curlin, director of sports programs here. Good to see you both. I'm going to just, there's a couple of uh, student questions. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, sure. I feel like I'm playing the role of like the, the sideline reporter here. 
Hey, go um, so, and, and it actually, one of the first one I ask, Coach, uh, kind of p- plays off of what you were just saying about, you know, navigating your Jets team through, you know, through an unprecedented time. How about now? Yeah, now we talked about COVID and, and you know, obviously it, it, it pushing back the season. But how have the protests throughout the country, both what happened in the bubble, but also what's happened in, in Portland and Kenosha, how is that affecting the camaraderie of the players kind of in, in, your, in your locker room? And how are you helping them to navigate that? Well, I, I think our players are really together as a group. We, we talk about all this stuff uh, in length um, when we have TV. We've been very fortunate. Our players have been in the building. We've been in the building now two and a half months. So as this stuff has been unfolding, and, we, and we, we've told them this, and, and this is just kind of our stand at ASU, we've told all our student athletes that when they see moments of injustice and racism appears, we encourage them to use their platform. But here's the deal. Be a voice of reason and solutions. We want them to be involved. We want them to be involved. Uh, this Friday, we actually have voter registration for all our players. We're bringing them here so they can sign up to vote. We're not telling them who to vote for, but they're going to have an opportunity to sign up to vote. So we're big on this. It starts with, with, with Ray, the AD. It starts with our president, Dr. Crow. We, we fully invest our time when it comes to things like this in our players. Mm-hmm. Now, and a follow-up on that, Coach, and I think we talked about this last time you and I spoke, is, I mean, you, you know, you had a you had a you know a race a, a racial incident happened with your players back in June with the three yeah. players who you know went to, went to the Whataburger and <laughs> you know and if you could kind of you know <laughs> what, what what happened there and what were the lessons what well, were the lessons from that well I'm glad you brought that because you know the lessons were it, it turned out no no one was hurt that was great no 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 parties were hurt people were a little embarrassed maybe but I told them this at that point in time. Uh, if, if, if the young folks on the, and I, and, and I will tell young folks this, just make sure, you know, that your actions, you think about what you're going to do when you, when, when you decide to do something, how does it affect people? Well, you're talking about 11 o'clock at night. Um, we had just had the, um, you know, the, the protests and things going on. So our country right now is a little bit raw, a little bit nervous, right? They have a right to be because there's things happening. And so they go to this Whataburgers, they go through a drive through Okay, three black players, they go through a drive-thru at 11 o'clock at night, and uh, they don't have a car, so they start knocking on windows to try to get someone that's going through the drive-thru to buy them uh, some food. So they knock on this lady's window, happened to be a white lady, and she's spooked, right? And she says what she says, and the manager says what he says, and whatever. So when it all settles down, it, it, the dust clears, I bring the players in. And I tell him this. I said, let me tell you something. I said, it worked out fine. I said, because you guys aren't hurt. The lady said something. Words, you know, words are words. Don't worry about that. The Whataburger place ended up, the CEO calling our players and apologizing to them. But I told him this. I said, let me tell you something. You got to think about what you're doing here. I said, what if that lady would have had a gun? Right. If he thought you guys were trying to rob her. She sees three black guys. One black guy comes to her car. She don't know you guys. This is dark, 11 o'clock at night. And if she had rolled down the window and shot somebody, she might have not been wrong. Because she said, I thought they was going to rob me. I said, so you got to think about what you do. Right. You know, and they didn't, that didn't, they didn't think about that. But then when I, when I looked at them, and I'm, there's, all three of them in my office, they looked at me and went, coach. And I said, that's the stuff I'm talking about. We're in an era now in America where it's very unsettling for a lot of people. A lot of people are nervous, right? right. And so you just have to be careful of what you do and, 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 and the places you put yourself in. Because everyone's not going to react calm, right? right? So that's kind of my answer to that question. All right. And uh, another one, Coach. Um, so in terms of all of that's going on, Mm. pandemic that's going on yeah. is is Gabrielle Ducharme asks um you know how do you they're also you know you also you know you're coaching a football team so how do you kind of manage that and help help the players kind of manage what they need to do versus what they you know it's basically what they're doing is uh, what 
you know, what you want to see them do as men, we want to see them do as football players, in the middle of all of that's going on, how do you manage that? Well, we, we live in a world where young people have to multitask because that's what they do. Now, it's just a matter of which, what are your priorities, right? Your priorities first are you're a student athlete. You're a student athlete, that's your priorities. Okay, then you're this person, you're this being, you're this, am, 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 am I one that wants to make a, a difference in life? Do I, do, do, I, do I have things to say? If so, that's great. You have a platform. How you go about using that is very important. Those are the conversations we have. When my players ask me, coach, I wanna do this. I say, oh, do you wanna do this? I say, so tell me what you're, what are you thinking, right? They come to me and they go, think, and I said, no, no, no. What about doing it this way? Oh, coach, that makes a lot more sense. Look, I was involved in all this. I, I've seen this movie before. In 68, the Vietnam War, the protests, right? All this stuff, the, the King assassination. I grew up in that year. I was 14 years old. I've seen this movie before. And to be quite honest, it's a bad movie. It's really a bad movie. It's sad, right? But when I get energy and where I get my energy now, I see the young people involved in it now. And I'm going, this is different. This is different than in the 60s. If they keep continuing what they're doing, this, this is going to work. They're going to make change. And that's what has to happen. There has to be change. It can't be talk. It can't be give some people some more money to be, make them be quiet. We got to change. Hey, hey, Harold, let me ask you one thing. Uh, I know you got a lot of questions. We, we talked about change in, in policing. Yeah. And we talked about in this country, you know, you, it, it's harder to be a barber. It's harder to be a barber than a policeman. No. Uh, I mean, in terms of time, it, ta it, it takes to, to do that. Your thoughts about that? I'm asking you again because, yeah. We had, I'm glad you said that because we had uh, two of the local officers speak to our team uh, Monday. They came in and addressed our team about if a policeman stops you, um, a lot of different things, right? Just to, to get the side of the policeman. And I told our players this, I said, let me tell you something. It's just like, you know, you watch a, 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 you watch a game, a sporting event, and a team loses like he loses and they lose again. And you say, you know, as a fan, the first thing you say, those guys are terrible. That's a bad team. Well, you actually got three guys that made the Pro Bowl on that team. And I say the same, and I told our team that it's the same thing with these, with police officers. There's a lot of really good police officers. So don't paint this big picture of when you see a police officer, he's a bad guy. No, 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 he's not a bad guy. Don't do that. that. That's the easy way out. I said, what you got to realize is this. Can you imagine that guy's job right now? The job he has? How fearful he is when he gets out of a car because right. of how people, the perception of these guys, because of, because of a few, because of a few. And I've said this, you know, the, 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 the conduct, there has to be a conduct policy along with accountability and when the conduct is to a place where it doesn't represent your division, then the guy has to go. You got to get him out. And he can't go somewhere else. He has to get out. And until you're willing to do that, you can't make change. And, 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 and you know, so that's what they wrestle with. And, and, and it's tough because they're in the spotlight right now. Right. Right? I mean, they're in the spotlight. Everything they do. And they're, look, their lives are in danger. And, and here's the problem. When you make emotional decisions, when you make emotional decisions with a weapon, somebody dies. When you make an emotional decision as a football player, it's a penalty. <laughs> and there's the difference. And I tell players all the time, hey man, you cannot be emotional. You got to take the emotion out of this because when you make emotional decisions, anybody, anybody on the screen, I'm telling you right now, 99% of the time, when you make an emotional decision, it's wrong. And you know, as soon as you did, you went, oh, I was emotional. You can't go there. You can't go there. And when you have a weapon in your hand and you become emotional, something bad's going to happen. They got to take that out of that. Herm, a question I've seen a couple times back onto the back on the field somewhat is and and Bill alluded to it you know it's you know you said it too you know 
there's a lot of black football players. There's not a whole lot of black football coaches. No. So how, and this is one of these questions you hear come up and you get just kind of like, how can that get better? Like I, I, I read something, I read something over the weekend. I think it was something like with the conferences not playing this year, you know, with, with, with Pac-12. It's like the number of black coaches, coaches have been like cut in half. So how both at the collegiate level and the NFL level, how can that get better? Well, the collegiate level is embarrassing, to be quite honest. Now, our conference is not, because we have five black coaches that are head coaches. We have a couple of ADs. We have two or three ADs. We have one at Stanford, one here, one at uh, UCLA for the first time. There might be one more as well. I'm, I'm not quite for sure. But I, I think it goes back to the hiring practices. And again, who is in the room of influence? Right. It all goes back to that. We are all influenced. Everyone on the screen is influenced by the people we allow in our circle. And when that circle looks all the same and they have the same values, you never grow. You know, I, you know and Bill will laugh at this. And I'm going to laugh at it too because it's kind of funny. You know, you, and, and, and I, wanna, I don't want to make this a black white thing because it's not. But it's funny to me, uh, a white person will come up to me and say, Well, I have a black friend. I'm like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, it's like, what did you just say? I mean, you got a black friend. What does that mean? Until you sit down and have a conversation and live in that person's shoes, you have no idea. You have no idea. You, 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 because that's not in the world you live in. And if you're not willing to do that, you never learn. You know, learning is about being in someone else's shoes. Well, how do you do that if you don't allow them in the conversation? <laughs> right. All you do is get, look, and, I, and here, I'm going to say it now, and I hate to say this. <laughs> I hate to say this, Bill, but it's the truth. This stuff happens at home. You're right. This happens at the supper table. When right. your kids are, like my daughters, 14 and 13 years old, what are you talking about? Exactly. What are you, what is the conversation around the subject? Now today, well, they can say, well, we don't have, we don't have supper together. Well, then get on Zoom. Get on Zoom with your children. Right. And talk to them. Because until we're willing to do that, it's very difficult. It's difficult. It's because it's a hard subject. And, it, and when it doesn't apply to you, it's like, well, it don't apply to me. I'm good. Right. Yeah, you good, but it ain't about you. Right, right. And, and right. I just think that's the hard conversation. But it starts at home. I say this all the time. Good soup and character made at home. <laughs> you know, it's made at home. <laughs> I, mean, I learned everything that I learned. Most of the stuff I learned on this stuff, I learned at the supper table with my mom and dad. Right. I love that. that. That's a good place. A good soup. I like that. Split no. pea. Split pea. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Aaron, listen, this has been tremendous. Um, if you have, um, well, I think one of the, the, as we close out, I want you to leave everybody with a thought. Because one of the things that you said, I, I keep thinking about Coach Thompson and yeah. his life. And basically, everybody's a, a party of one or a leader of one. And in other words, you make a change. You decide to make the change. Everybody on this Zoom call, you're a party of one. You're the one that makes the change. Or you're the one, if you see something wrong, do you have the courage to call it out? Do you call it, so what would, your, what would your, your, your sort of parting shot, your closing thought be to everybody on this call about how do, we, how do we make the change? Well, I think it works this way right now in America. Um, you could stand still in silence, and if you do that, it's really not about change for you. It's about keeping the status quo. And that's something you got to decide personally. And no one can make you do that. You got to want to do that. You, you, you got to really want to do that, right? I mean, and that's hard. Because young people, you know, they say, hey, I got it. I'm good. I'm okay. I get it. You're good. And, and, and that's how it is. But if you stand in silence, because here's the problem that we see now. There's always been what we call in America because of the way the system was founded. 
and because of the way the system was built, all right? When you think about it, there's always been racism. And we said it's been hidden. Not hidden anymore because of TV. That's right. On camera now. And most people now don't like it. They don't like what it looks like. So where do you sit when you see it? Where do you, that's the question you gotta ask. Because not only is it gonna affect you, it's gonna affect your children. Do you wanna make it better for your children? And when you're in college right now, you have no idea, well, I'm just trying to get through college. I get that. But when you become my age, you're gonna have to ask yourself that question. And maybe you can live with that, that's okay. But you, gotta, you, you have a chance right now in America, if you really wanna make a difference, are you willing to say something and not stand silent? That's up to you. That, 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 that's, that's the right of America, of being an American. You can choose whatever you want, but you will be held accountable for that. That's right. That's great. And vote. Hey, this is a great Herm Edwards. Uh, uh, Herm, this has been tremendous, man. Uh, really been tremendous. Like I said, I have tremendous respect for you. Um, and, uh, you know, man, just uh, this is a unique time. Well, but, it, but you're, 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 you're a unique young, human being. Yeah, well, thank you, my brother. And, and all these young people, really, I, 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 I encourage you. Don't let, get out of your comfort zone. Don't, don't, get out of your comfort zone. It's okay. You could do it. It's okay. Right. Right. Brett, you want to take us back, uh, take us home? Uh, I, will, I, will, I, 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 I can't follow you two. Uh, I mean, that, that was just, that was wonderful. And, and, and thank you all the students. I know there were a lot of questions that, you know, we didn't have time to answer. And, but I mean, I'll be back again. I got a couple, I got a, what, I got four or five more classes to coach and teach. <laughs> we, we, we'll have you back whenever both y'all. And also I encourage you, I'm going to put a link here in the chat. Um, you know, those, you know, I mean, Bill's done some wonderful writing on this exact issue uh, for the undefeated. Uh, just even literally just in the last like two weeks. I mean, he's, yeah. Bill's been doing it for, for a very yeah. long time right on this. But particularly, you know, the conversation about the bubble and and the, and the protests there and such, you know, I encourage everyone to read it and and just both of y'all, I, I can't can't thank you enough for for what both you do uh, both you do for our, for our students. So th thank you both. Thank you. God bless everybody. Stay thank safe. You. Take care now. Take care, gang. We'll talk to you later, brother. Okay. Hey, thanks, Herb. All right, man. Thanks, everybody.